In today's video, we're going to go over some more TikTok conspiracies. Let's get into it. It's a funny podcast. Thank you. You guys are good together. I want to talk to you about an episode that I saw. But uh, you, you having to go to Israel? Was that on that or was that somewhere else? It was that. What was that like? Tell me what happened. Oh, God. Do you not want to talk about I it? Do it. Because I, I'm not saying anything that's like wrong. It's just something no. that happened. So, I get a call from Steve Byrne. Okay. And Steve goes, you want to go to Israel? And I go, why? I don't want to do a show there. And he goes, no. You know, I got a call and he, they're flying out a bunch of comedians and actors. And it's a free trip. And I go, why? I don't know. They just want to show us the country and their culture. And you get nice hotels, free meals, and you get a tour of like. Are you not performing? No. Nothing. Okay. So I went there with Jamie Chung, Brian Greenberg, their actors, and Steve Lopez went out, George Lopez. Okay. And we went out there. And then when we got there, they were like, welcome. We're like, thanks. And they were like, but every day you have to tweet how great Israel is. Every day. Yeah, like put out a tweet. They told you you have to, and they didn't say anything about that before you left? I don't remember them saying it before. But they might have? They could have. Right, maybe they said it to Steve, and Steve conveniently left it out? I don't know, but I, I just I do know that I, I, feel, I feel like if they did say it, that I would have questioned it. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if I don't know. Aware. But here's what happened. As soon as I tweeted the first thing, Mm-hmm. I already knew, like, oh, my God, I think I'm in trouble. Hey, I mean, at least he's coming clean with that response because I'm sure there's a lot of people that would be like, oh, yeah, it was great, and they would just push that under the rug, you know, not really say the whole reason why they were there. So I give the guy credit for that. Um, I mean, to be honest, I'd probably do the same. If someone wanted to fly me out to their country so I could live nice for a little while and they just say, hey, just talk nice about our country on Twitter, I could do that. I really could. I don't think anybody would not be able to, as long as it's a good place, you know? Like, you're actually promoting something good. I do not believe that he did not know that beforehand. I, I feel like that's something you would know. Like, people know why they are getting sent out to a place. So to say that, oh, I don't know, maybe, it's just like, eh, come on, you knew. Family, they are real. Fish with a human head, and we have the footages of it. Another one? And another one, but look at the video. And an uncharted. In the tranquility of Lake Samsara, scientists have made an astounding discovery. A find that disrupts the established norms of biology and beckons us to question what we know about life itself. Here, in the depths of Samsara, swim a unique species of fish, a species that bears an eerie resemblance to our own kind. They have been named as homo species. But family, you know what the most bizarre thing is? You see these men on sticks, they are the Dogon tribe. And they were the first to talk about the fish people. When they talk about Sirius B and C, they were the ones that discovered it. They had contact with them and they said they were fish people. Ancient depictions around the world are showing us people that looks like fish. And now they found a lake with fishes that look like this. I mean... I'm fairly certain that those were just AI-generated videos. They might not have been, but I think they were. What do you guys think? AI-generated videos? Or am I just missing out on a whole other species that I didn't know existed? Today was a crazy day. I saw this International Space Station crossing the moon, and I thought to myself, how come it's only about a quarter of the size of a plane crossing the moon? Seems like it'd be much smaller than that. Especially when we look at the size comparison and see that both an airplane and the International Space Station are about the same size as a football field. And then you look at a football field from an airplane window and you realize that it looks pretty small from there. So then I wonder, is this really 250 miles away? Then I thought to myself, well it can't be fake because I can go on YouTube and watch the live stream of the ISS coursing across the face of the earth. And someone obviously took this picture, and I know you can track it, and there's people who see it all the time, but the live feed footage doesn't look much higher than a weather balloon. And we all know most satellites are launched by balloon. So then I came across this thing, which is a U.S. patented triangular spacecraft that uses what is called unconventional spacecraft propulsion systems 
which is a spacecraft having a triangular hull with vertical electrostatic line charges on each corner that produce a horizontal electric field parallel to the sides of the hull. This field interacting with a plane wave emitted by the antennas on the sides of the hull generates force per volume combining both lift and propulsion. Then I find out that these electrostatic propulsion systems are used in satellites? Then I start to look into electrostatic levitation? What? Then I find out about the electrostatics in our atmosphere that it has an equipotential increase of 100 volts per meter? Which could possibly be the reason for the downward bias of things trying to seek equilibrium on the ground? And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I figure out that liquid oxygen is actually magnetic? And I'm like, wait a minute. Hold on. If liquid oxygen is magnetic, and frozen oxygen is this beautiful sky blue, then does liquid oxygen somehow interact with this electrostatic orbital electromagnetic field? I don't know. Wait, what? Then I found this thing, a toroidal field made out of copper and stones. All of a sudden, he hangs this golden necklace over it, and it starts orbiting. Oh, have you seen the path of the ISS over the flat Earth? Yeah, that's the path it takes, the International Space Station path over the flat Earth. It's a toroidal field. I don't know. This is why they don't want us to do our own research, because simply just asking a question about this sent me on this whole rabbit trail of uh, finding a lot of other things. Hey, this was pretty interesting. I liked the concept of being able to see that space station near the moon. That's a really cool photo, first of all. He's got so many good points about the size of the crafts compared to an airplane and a football field and, and seeing it at that height and at that size. It's... There's a lot to tie in together there that makes it seem like, yeah, there's definitely some foolery going on with the space station. If that's not the space station, what is that? Is it just a satellite that's monitoring us? Like, there's so many questions I would have about that. And, and we got some more Flat Earth and Globe Earth conspiracies. I think I've came up with a couple of good names for it. When you're a flat earther, I'm going to call you a flirther. When you're a globe earther, I'm going to call you a glurther. <laughs> Should be a fun little way of communicating the two sides. I'm in the middle, so I'm a I'm in the middle of flat and globe. I really don't know what it is yet, so I need to come up with a certain type of name for me. I am sure a lot of people in the comments will just say an idiot. Hey. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and like the video and subscribe to the channel. I only ask once per video and I make videos like this every day. And it would be awesome to see you come back again tomorrow. What is a shaman? A shaman is someone who walks between both worlds, the spirit world and the physical realm. A shaman also has knowledge of the local plants that are in their area and or knows how to work with the body physically, psychically often. And typically a shaman would ask you, when did you stop singing? When did you stop dancing? When did you stop telling your story? And so, because people get out of sorts, they create disease from their mind. Dis-ease ends up in the body. A shaman helps guide you out of the disease or dysfunction you find yourself in. That's interesting. I've had a couple of subscribers uh, ask for me to do more shaman content. So this was a nice little introduction to what a shaman is. Uh, I find this very interesting and I can't wait to dig in a little bit deeper about shamans because I do like the theory of meditation and help awaken one's mind to its fullest potential. I do not necessarily believe that shamans are like magical per se. I would not say that they can just cast spells and stuff, but I do think a shaman is someone that can help guide you through problems, through issues. Uh, it can help you with health benefits. I really think that shamans can help guide you in all different types of way than just spiritually. That might be one of the ways. I feel like shamans just have more than just spiritual ties. They, they kind of help ease the mind and the body, not just the soul. Challenge begins as it's time to place a glass container over each object. 
This will prevent air movement from disturbing them. And then also, once in a while, using that intention that you just felt in your mind, intending it to move. And I find that it's best to not force a direction. Don't make it turn clockwise or counterclockwise. The intention is just that it moves. That want, that desire, that request. Without words, just that little bubble in your mind. You're sending it to the object. So it's really more of your subconscious nature, the deeper you that's setting that impulse and it's connecting with the energy that's causing the movement. But one thing that's very important is to keep your eyes open and looking at the object and let your eyes choose where they want to go. As the participants relax and apply the instructions, the objects begin to move. A common question comes up. Ah, so how do I know you. it's not just electrostatic? Sean knows that by touching the glass, there's too much room for doubt about whether or not this is telekinesis. Are their hands simply warming up the air inside the container, creating air movement? There's only one way to answer that question. And Brett's actually at the stage where we can go next. Do you notice that his hands are about an inch or two away yes. from the glass? Yeah. So that'll remove the doubt that, oh, maybe my hands are warming up the glass and it's hot air causing convection. They take their hands off the container, but keep them nearby to maintain their sense of connection. Soon, the objects begin to move again. If, if it's pausing and you want to try moving it without moving your hands, again, rely on the breathing technique. Take a nice deep breath. Notice that blip in your mind. It's frequently during the holding the breath in or holding the breath out when your mind shifts. We have to ask, you know, is, were the hands even necessary? And I just regard them as training wheels. Several minutes pass. And this is where you really rely on relaxation, attention, your eyes to guide the, where the energy goes. So. Each person will need to relax even more deeply and apply greater intention if they want to be successful. This is challenging because until now, it was assumed that energy from the hands was required to move the object. Too much mental stress at this point might prevent telekinesis from happening. Finally, the objects begin to move. This is gonna sound funny. When I was a kid, I actually used to do this very same thing um, because I just thought it was really cool. I thought that that was an amazing thing that I had superpowers because I could make a piece of aluminum foil on a toothpick spin in circles in a glass container. Um, I'm not necessarily a believer in this now because there's so many factors of science that actually work into this. What would make me more of a believer is if, one, you could lift up the aluminum foil. And why does it always have to be aluminum foil? They always pick aluminum foil or paper. I personally, like, you want to make it more realistic. And I know it's, it's, it's difficult and you're trying to practice with your mind to make it stronger. But to, to, to me, to make it more authentic and genuinely, okay, this is telekinesis, is get a nut and a bolt, put that bolt straight up and put that nut on the top of it and screw that nut down the bolt with your mind. Put it in the glass container and everything and make that nut go down the bolt and then make the nut go back up the bolt. If you can do that, then yes, I am now thoroughly convinced that you have some kind of telekinetic power. I don't know, what do you guys think? Is that too aggressive or is that actually make sense? Because I feel like the aluminum foil on a toothpick thing is just too easy. There's too much static. There's too much heat that can cause movement in that glass container. There's a whole bunch of factors that can affect that piece of aluminum foil. When was the rapture added to the Bible? Rapture added to the Bible? No, no, that's part of the, that's a canonized text. No, that ain't no canonized text. Who wrote the scripture 
It was actually a footnote. What year was it written? And why was it added to the Bible? William James Darby, 1835, added a footnote to a biblical text on a theory he had about a rapture event. Doesn't really exist. Later on, some pastors saw it as a way to great, a great way to control people and added it as the canonized text and reprinted it as published, you know, text in the Bible. As if it was a real verse. Doesn't exist. You see? Doesn't exist. <laughs> but you can ask these questions. They have no clue about these questions. They have no clue about the answer to these questions because they don't do any research. The pastor jumps up and he screams and he screams and he sweats all over the place and his sweat splashing on you and he's knocking you out with these, with these invisible power blows and everything else. And you're getting you all hype and they're playing the music at the right frequency that gets everybody shaking. A good rock and roll song would make you do the same thing. I see Michael Jackson on stage have people in the audience shaking, vibrating and talking in tongues and passing out just like a pastor could do. It's all about the right frequency and vibration. And I agree uh, as far as the frequency and vibration, you know, comparing a pastor to Michael Jackson and their similar side effects of the audience paying attention to them are very true. I, I, I believe that 100%. I think that if a person is praised enough that people will believe and feel whatever that person wants them to in a way they they get taken in the moment type deal it's kind of like really good acting sometimes when you watch a movie that has really good acting and it's a sad movie it actually makes you sad or excited or scared it's the same concept you're feeling that emotion from those people and it, it feeds it, it's like it feeds you and you feed into it it's it's pretty crazy and also, I would like to know, because I do play a number of Billy Carson videos on my channel. He's just all over TikTok. Um, I would like to know if he is getting too annoying or if you guys are okay with his content. I do not mind his content. I truly think that what he is talking about, he believes. I think that... He is genuinely authentic in his belief. I don't think that he's just trying to sell anybody anything, even though he does have a book. But the way he just demonstrates or the way that he just presents himself is very confident in what he's saying, and it just doesn't seem sell-off. So what do you guys think of Billy Carson? Do you guys want me to continue with some of his videos or maybe slow him down a bit? Just let me know in the comments. Why did God create Satan even though he can see the future? Because you know how God can see all yeah, things, yeah. right? So the debate was, why would he create Lucifer even though he knows all of the yeah, angels no sense, yeah. would blah, 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 right? Now check this out. All of God's angels, the main angels are who? Gabriel, Daniel, Raphael, right? All of these angels, they end in what? L. Okay. Lucifer ends in what? L? It's not an L. R. Lucifer. Lucifer is the only one that fell. No, check this out, fam. Uh -huh. So the theory is he created because as a choice. So I know you're going to fail, but let's just see if you prove me wrong type of thing. Because oh. it's just free will. It's literally just free will. It's like you being a father to a son and letting him choose by himself if he's going to be doing good or bad. Yeah. yeah. Because you gave him that choice of, of being free. The option. Now, because do you think God, uh, he forces like a root on us, but like, even though there's another root, he doesn't play God. You know what I mean? No, no, no. I think everybody has a root and everybody's meant to do something. But at the end of the day, there's many. Yeah. He's not going to butt yeah. in and put you on that root, but you're going to have to make yeah. the, the exactly Because two past me just lead into one destiny. Yeah. All yeah. This was an interesting video. I really like this topic and I have a feeling there's a lot of people in the comments that will uh, chime in on this as well because I would like to know a little bit more. I'm not like the most knowledged person on biblical religion or anything like that. I'm still learning as I grow and get older, but um, there's a lot of people that have way more information than I do and I really enjoy hearing about it. So I would like to know, you know, if that's truly the case on as to why God created Satan, if God knows everything or if he can see the future, then he would have seen that, you know, Satan would have tried to spread his evil across the world, wouldn't he have? Or is there a reason for it? Like there's an ultimate purpose at the end or is it 
just a test to see how strong humanity's faith is into God. Because I'm curious about that question, honestly. And I'm sorry if you don't enjoy those two individuals and their content. They are a really hyper and very, like, loud and obnoxious. I do enjoy their videos. They come up with some really good topics that I like to listen about. But I get that they are really obnoxious. What in the ever-living fuck is that? Oh my god, that's so scary. What is that? I'm not even tripping. Oh, that's so scary. Oh my god. Like, I'm not tripping, right? That's... What is that? That's an Oscar right now. I think this is it. I think this is the aliens. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think that's just trash in water. I think that this person is just trying to play us for a fool. And uh, that is just trash in water, I'm pretty certain. What do you guys think? Am I seeing things? Is that really the sky or is that just trash water? I really don't know how this video got into my likes. I don't remember liking this video, but hey, it's funny and kind of true. If you're the if you're the type of individual that likes to like smoke, this one might trip you out. You are now literally beginning to experience the physical effects of your world splitting into multiple parallel reality versions of Earth. Literally, physically. The idea is you're going to see a lot more shakeups and breakups because you are disassembling the idea that you live in one reality and beginning to understand that no matter that you can still see a reality you don't prefer, it doesn't mean you're living in it. There are now what might euphemistically be referred to as glass walls beginning to appear between the different reality vibrations. So even though you may still be able to see a reality you don't prefer and people making choices you don't prefer, just because you can see them doesn't mean that what they're doing can reach you through that glass wall. These walls are filters now. They are beginning to exist as thickening energy. And less and less and less will you be able to receive or experience the effects of someone else's reality that is not vibrationally compatible with the reality you prefer. But you, by living the reality you prefer, because the others on the other side of the glass walls can still see you too, allows you to become a living example of other kinds of choices that they can also make should they decide to do so. So when you live in your passion, act on your passion to the best you can with no insistence, no assumption as to what that outcome is supposed to look like, you steer yourself more and more strongly in the direction of the reality you prefer, the version of Earth that you're shifting to. Because remember, you never change the Earth you're on. You change yourself, and in increments, you shift to other versions of coexisting Earths that are simply more and more reflective of the changes you're making within you. I really like this conspiracy. I think it's a really fun one. I'm not a huge believer in parallel universes, but I do enjoy the concept of them. And this was probably explained uh, in one of my most favorite ways. Basically, in order to slip through a parallel universe, because we're not just randomly slipping through them, it's because we are bettering ourselves and our self is being transferred into a better parallel universe. That's a really cool concept and I really like that. All right, guys, I think I'm gonna end the video here and with that being said, have a good day.